I'm so excited to be here. Um, this was one of the least productive days at the University of Michigan. Several thousand people took the day off. <laughs> and I walked through the hallways earlier today and everybody was listening to this. And so I don't only welcome you, but the 2,000 or so people that are watching right now uh, online. So you're part of a huge community. Michigan is not just a location, the University of Michigan. It's a name of a powerful network that you're all part of. My story I'm telling uh, today is a story of exploration. And it's a story of exploration that starts right here at the University of Michigan. The building pointed out with the orange arrow is the Space Research Lab, where a small instrument was built, an identical copy of which is right next to me, an instrument that is right now as we speak orbiting planet Mercury, and is doing so on the first uh, spacecraft to ever orbit that planet. That planet, of course, is a planet of extremes. It's the smallest planet. It's made out of the heaviest stuff, uh, mo mostly of uh, iron and many other things, but it's also a planet that sees the brunt of the sun 11 times stronger than anything uh, we see at Earth. And not only the light, the radiation that heats the planet uh, during noon, the planet is uh, as hot as a burning house. During midnight, the planet is 100 times colder than anything that has ever been measured on Earth. Not only that is happening, also the sun is throwing out all these hot clouds and plasma that are hitting the planet almost uninhibited because the planet only has a very, very small magnetic field. Mercury is almost unknown to this day because, of course, you know, you look at the, the picture there, I, showed, I show you here everything that you've seen in your textbooks at school. Why? Because the backside of it is entirely unknown. We're filling that in right now with this spacecraft. This probe, Messenger, is, as I said, orbiting the planet right now. And on there, on that spacecraft, is a little hole. In there goes gas from the planet, sputtering off the surface. Gas from the sun, really hot gas. And out the back, through that antenna of that spacecraft, uh, this instrument that you see right now is sending down information about the planet we do not know, we have never known before, and will revolutionize our understanding. Like every time we look at nature, we're surprised and we're amazed. That's what we're doing. So my crazy idea is an idea that started and basically said, I want to build a totally new instrument with a team that has never worked together at 30% of the cost, at 20% of the weight of this thing, three times as durable for a customer who does not like risks, <laughs> NASA. <laughs> and what I'm going to tell you now is the lessons that I learned from this in seven steps. In 1998, it's a while ago, all of a sudden, technologies were available that enabled, in fact, the spacecraft to go around this planet. Solar panels before that really didn't work at the temperatures they need to work at planet Mercury. These technologies were available, and in fact, we wanted to build such an instrument because of all the reasons that I just told you. However, the status quo of these instruments was something like this, and we needed to be something like that. It's a lot harder to shrink these kind of things than it is when you first think about it. And in fact, we started to worry about it, think about it, and here's lesson number one. You have a crazy idea, go work on it. It may actually work. Go work on your crazy idea. Our idea was, let's build a fisheye lens. All the particles should come in from different directions and basically uh, open up space in a way that we didn't need high voltages to do so. And so we would see the whole environment of the plasma, just like this landscape here. This is how it looked. I wrote a paper. It, was, it worked great on the computer. This is what we thought we would see. This is what we saw. Nothing. <laughs> Not one particle went through, ever through that instrument. Not one. I realized I needed to learn a second lesson. I needed to find Bob. <laughs> Bob is the other guy. It's the guy who can take amazing, crazy ideas, is comfortable with them, and turn them into something that actually works in partnership. 
by myself. I could never do that. I needed Bob. And the problem was Bob was retired. He lived in Maryland. And what I needed to do is take the plane and to have a really humbling dinner over steak and basically say, hey, Bob, how about you sell your house and you move to Michigan to build this instrument at 30% the mass, you know, you get the point. <laughs> For somebody that doesn't like risks, Bob did it. And he came. And soon the third uh, lesson came, and that is to start building the team. I wanted to have great people, and I could only do that with Bob, because Bob knew the other side of the people that I didn't know. I needed the, the people with the right passion, and I needed to wait for the right people. I shouldn't get the first person in the door. I needed to get the person that was right for our team. And so we were uh, getting uh, motivated. We started uh, building an instrument. It looked like this, nice press release, you know, Diet Coke. It's uh, low weight, right? <laughs> the problem was it was flawed also. The good news is the particles now found their way through. It really worked. However, so did all the light. And that's no good. If you go next to mercury, radiation leaks, you're dead. So I started to really worry, and I started to really lose sleep over this, agonize over how we could ever make this work, Bob having moved, having a team. And I really all of a sudden noticed that the reason we didn't perform was not because of the team, it was because I needed to make the team work. There were certain things only I could do. For example, I should unleash the pot potential and encourage action. I should not be in the way. Even if I was worried, I should trust my team. In fact, I should encourage risk-taking. I wanted people to go try things and make this amazing thing happen. Without it, there was no chance. And in fact, I needed to make the team work and have them uh, really share with me good and bad news. If you're vegetarian, it's in reverse, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so, the other thing I learned is that I really wanted people on the team that were loud. They tell, told me if they worried about something, but I needed to put them on a leash. They couldn't go walk around and take everybody's courage away. And the other thing that's a really hard lesson is every once in a while you'll end up with somebody on the team who is a snake, goes behind people, starts undermining what you're about, and it is your job as a lead to cut the snakes out. And I needed to learn that the hard way. All of a sudden, we had a team that was working. The team came together and did amazing things. It started moving. It was exciting. And all of a sudden, I came to the office, and there was the phone ringing. On the other side was the entire team management, and they told me, we don't think you can be successful. You're running out of time. You're late. I went home, didn't sleep much that night, and I carried that load with me until all of a sudden, the next day, I decided I'm going to bring the team together. I said, everybody, I'm buying pizza. <laughs> Usually buying their lunch is more expensive than pizza, but this one was the appropriate one, and I told them, here's the challenge. What are we going to do about it? I went around the table, and it still moves me today when I think about what happened next. Bob said, we're going to make it work. The next guy over, Steve, said, yes, we will make it work. Next guy over, the team came together, and we started running and putting this thing together, starting to really accelerate and being motivated uh, with, in fact, uh, the pressure that came on us to be better. But it was not over. A few months later, I got another phone call. I want to throw that phone away soon. But uh, <laughs> the phone call was about a phone call from NASA, some eager manager at NASA realized that the spacecraft in some areas was overcast. And in order to punish us, they cut our instrument out. They threw us off the spacecraft. What I then learned is this is a problem I cannot solve. And I deployed one of the most important things that you have, I already talked to you about, your Michigan network. In this case, it was a guy called Len Fisk. And he looks like the a guy who made the Matrix, you know, the... Uh, <laughs> Go look him up. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure he did it, too. He was actually in charge of NASA, of all the science program. And what he did is he got 
ticked off and he went on the phone and two weeks later we were back on and that manager had a different job pretty soon. <laughs> so in 2003, we had this instrument in a box. We were ready to go deliver and a little later, in fact, remember how I told we were behind? We were the first instrument deliver to deliver to the spacecraft. And here's my family. My little girl is in the belly, if you can tell. And uh, in 2004, we took off and uh, went on a huge journey, which is my last lesson here. Be patient. Great things take time. To get to the sun, it takes forever. It's a cosmic billiard that has to bring you by the Earth, by Venus twice, by Mercury. I could tell you the whole story, but what I'm going to tell you is show you how time looks. Remember that little guy? <laughs> We just went into orbit uh, on St. Patrick's Day just a few weeks ago. This is where he, what he is looking like now. He's interested in, uh, in, of course, the instrument behind him, and before he was just interested in the lights that were shining at him, as you can tell. <laughs> it took a long time. We're in orbit now, and what we're doing is showing images, doing things that are amazing. These images are just coming down from the spacecraft, and they will rewrite the textbooks that uh, your children that our children are going to have and read and learn about this exciting planet that we currently do not know. So what are the lessons that I think are applicable to you also if you want to pursue your crazy idea? Don't get scared by the fact that something is tough. A crazy ideas are worth working on. Go find Bob. <laughs> you can't have mine. <laughs> I want to tell you something. One of the most moving things that happened to me is just a few weeks ago uh, when Bob came into my office and told me how much he is glad that he left his retired life and came to Michigan to work on this and how he works, loves working in the team and in fact it was one of the most amazing times in his entire life. So for me it worked out also for Bob. You then have to go and build the team, but more importantly, make the team work. Do what it takes. It is you to make that work and lead through the valleys of death, even though it looks like it's the last day of the project. There's another day later. Come on out the other side. Help the team help you come on the other side and ask for help. Many people, if you have a crazy enough idea, they will love to help you. Be patient because great things like time and like so many things, the only way I'm standing up here is because of my team. Now, of course, you thought this talk is about space or this talk is about this project. What this talk is really about is a challenge to you. And that is, what is your story you're going to text, talk about next year about your inspiration? A story that starts today because what we want to do is next year, we want to have the best idea acted upon up here, talking to you about what happened in that last year when it again says TEDx UFM. Thank you so much. <laughs>